personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech. Defended by force of arms, if necessary, welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans, both physically and philosophically, helps them fulfill our Founding Fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello and welcome back to the Resistance Library brought to you by Ammo.com. On the show today, we will be discussing Bowling Alone, based on the book of the same name. We will be talking about the kind of destruction of the, the Rust Belt, the breaking up of that, and how the decline of mutual aid societies and guilds and other things have kind of led to this stagnation and gradual decline of the American civil society. Please join us. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Resistance Library brought to you by Ammo.com. I'm your host, Dan, along with Sam, and today we're going to be discussing Bowling Alone, how Washington has helped destroy American civil society and family life. I think it's worth noting at the top of this episode, this one's a heavy one. I wish I had like a heavy alarm or like we could get the the editor to like put in one of those heavy alarm, like an alarm ringing, but... It's okay. it's all Milton Friedman's fault. There you go. <laughs> Saved you an hour. You should listen to, if you haven't listened to the Milton Friedman episode, because uh, we talk about um, the kind of role of Reagan and Milton Friedman and in this. Um, and I think that that's... Um, that's a good place to start to understand it. Yeah, it's, there's, there's, there's some overlap here. Um, so for those who don't know, Bowling Alone is the name of a book. Um, Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community by political scientist Robert D. Putnam. Um, the term Bowling Alone is basically the conceit is that people don't bowl in leagues anymore. They bowl alone. And this is a shorthand for a general kind of decay in civil society and social life in America. So going back, you know, a few decades, I, I'd say I was alive when, you know, but very young when this was still a thing that, you know, the bowling alley was the blue collar country club. Um, I think that the, the, the country club is kind of the blue collar country club um, because, you know, there's always these public courses that people of blue collar jobs congregate on and, you know, but, um, yeah. So you, you will be amazed to hear that the first million dollar endorsement sports deal in history was bowler Don Carter receiving a million dollars to bowl with an ebonite signature bowl ball designed for him in 1964. Hmm. Um, the way that bowling alleys drove their business was their league play because you'd have to come in for 30 weeks, once a week. Um, and when you did that, you know, it wasn't just about the money. It's like you're hanging out, the, you're hanging out in the bowling alley between 1940 and 1958. The United States Bowling Congress's membership blew up from 700,000 to 2.3 million. The Women's International Bowling Congress, um, that expanded from 82,000 to 866,000 during the same time period, uh, with the American Junior Bowling Congress blowing up from 8,000 to 175,000. When bowling leagues were a big thing, uh, that was 70% of a bowling alley's income. Now they get you about 40%. There's not anything magical about bowling. Uh, it's just that this is what people did. And this was their, what sociologists call a third place. It's not home. It's not work. It's cheers. It's the place where everybody knows your name. I was about to say like the bar down the alley or, or the bar down the street. Do you got one? I don't. No, I always sympathize with like Moe's or the drunken clam, but. I used to have a bar, but first of all, I don't drink anymore. Second of all, I don't live anywhere near where my bar was. But um, the the decline in bowling league membership isn't this kind of standalone thing. A number of other civic organizations in the United States have a sharp decline in their membership around this time. Uh, Knights of Columbus, which I always, as a Catholic gentleman, mean to join but never do. Uh, Benai Barith. Labor unions, Boy Scouts, the Red Cross, the Lions, the Elks, the Kiwanis, the Masons, 
uh, PTOs, League of Women Voters, Junior Chamber of Commerce, all have had dramatic reduction in their membership. Uh, church attendance would be another one. I think that the important thing for me is what that means is that there's fewer connections between people in their local communities and kind of what's replaced that is this god i i i i'm probably going to offend some people do it but like if you are over the age of 15 and you own a funko pop figure um i would suggest that you begin rethinking your life choices but the important part is that of that is that you know adults spend their money on these stupid Star Wars and Harry Potter knickknacks um, which are these, this is stuff for children guys like I'm I, you know I don't want to get too I don't want to go on some big judgy uh, rant here but like yeah it's it's to me it's indicative of a social problem that grown ass men care about owning a Millennium Falcon Lego set um, it's very very sad to me but uh, Putnam thinks that the Blame for this is on uh, technology. Television begins to get people spending their spare time at home, and the internet, you know, really puts that into overdrive. Um, I think that this is all very true, but I think that government policies, either by deliberate design or through negligence, have significantly eroded what we would call civil society, which is kind of, you know, not business, not, um, government, but the thing that the things that people do together when they don't have to go to work or they don't have to, um, be at home with their families. Yeah. And I'd, one, one comment I'd like to make on that is I wonder how many people listen to this show have gone to like a town hall. Obviously we're talking adults here, but how many have gone to a town hall and actually watched the civic process at work? Because I went probably a year or a year and a half ago. I went to a town hall because they were deciding on the budget for the city for the next, it was like their 10 year plan, right? They were redoing their 10 year plan and it was upgrading like all of this workout stuff and upgrading the roads and There's a very prominent skate park in my hometown that's situated right underneath a bridge. So what they were going to do is they were just going to tear down the skate park, redo the bridge, and then not put anything up in its place. So like the kids wouldn't have anywhere to go. Like they'd have to drive 45 minutes to find a new skate park, which, I mean, growing up and being kind of part of that class, I wanted to make sure, you know, that they were taken care of. So I witnessed a bunch of kids over the age of 15, under the age of 30, show up to this town hall just to advocate to add a skate park. And these were 15. That's so cool. Yeah, 15, 20 something year olds who all like got up, stood in line, and waited their chance to tell the mayor, who fell asleep, by the way, during this, that, you know, they, they wanted a place to go. But. I saw kids fighting harder for their for their civil society, their little local community than I've seen some 40, 50 year olds. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's like you make a good point with that, because, yeah, there's not like, you know, I would be I've mentioned on here before that in New England, a a popular form of um, government organization is the town meeting where like literally anyone who shows up gets to vote on what the town's policy is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I would be very curious to know how many people under the age of 60 are showing up at these things. The answer probably lies somewhere in, if it's not directly affecting me anymore, I'm not going to show up. Yeah, but there's totally like men of our grandfather's generation, you know, not like all of them would have, but it would have been much more common um, for people you know, in the kind of prime of their life to be showing up every week because it's it's simply because it's important to participate. Yeah. Right. Civic duty. That's what they used to call it. Right. But we don't have any concept of that anymore. Um, we, so we talked uh, like, this is so weird because I feel like there's, I feel like a lot, I'm just going to refer a lot of people back to the Milton Friedman episode because I feel like we talked a lot of this kind of to death during the Milton Friedman episode. But, um, 
you know, we, you can't really talk about the destruction, the decline of civil society and social capital in the United States without discussing the destruction of the Rust Belt. There, there, you know, it's not like that the deindustrialization of the Rust Belt is the only reason why the population declined. Um, one big reason is just that, like, air conditioning exists now. And so Phoenix is a lot more attractive place to live <laughs> and Buffalo is a lot less attractive place to live. Um, as somebody who grew up in the Northeast, like I know that the stereotype of Northeasterners is that we're all very brusque and rude. And that's because it's cold. <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> you don't have any time to waste on a conversation when it's 10 degrees out with negative 20 wind chill. You just got to get to the point and keep moving. Um, but yeah, so I mean, this is always weird to me is that like three of the 10 biggest cities in 1940 were Detroit, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh. Those were big cities in America. Cleveland was a top 10 city in America. Mm -hmm. um, Cleveland and Pittsburgh had dropped off in 1980. Detroit hung around t until 2010 in the top 10, which is, I, that's very surprising to me. Uh, but it was the first uh, city to have its population drop below 1 million. Um, then there's like, if you start looking outside the top 10, um, Buffalo, which used to be a huge deal. In 1960, Buffalo was the was the 20th largest city in America. And I want to look at, because I feel like these are the... Um, the, the best way to make these, to kind of contextualize these, is what the 20th largest city in America is in, you know, it's going to be 2010 because we don't have um, statistics yet from the last census. So the 20th largest city in the United States uh, as of the last census was, wa was Washington, D.C., um, Buffalo is now the 71st largest city in the United States. Its population was cut more than in half. It fell from 532,000 to 261,000. Cincinnati used to be the 21st largest city in America. Um, that is That slot is now held by Boston. Um, and the population of Cincinnati fell from 502,000 in 1960 to 296,000 in um, 2010, it is now the 63rd largest city in America. Gary, Indiana is, I believe, the most extreme example. It lost almost 100,000 people, which is like way over half its population. It went from 178,000 uh, in 1960 to 80,000. Now, granted, it was only the 70th largest city, which, you know, again, for context, um, that's Plano, Texas. So it's not like Gary was this big, you know, teeming metropolis, but like there are cities that have been carpet bombed that lost fewer people than Gary lost due to deindustrialization. Right. Deeply, deeply tied to deindustrialization and the financial financialization of the economy. Um, again, like, you know, central air does play a big role in this because Let's look at the top 10 now. Um, Los Angeles w would have been in the top 10, but like Los Angeles is a weird example because it's not like it gets hot, but it's, it's dry heat, as they say. And it's generally not super extreme. Um, but like Houston, Phoenix, San Antonio, Dallas, Austin, Jacksonville, Fort Worth. Yeah. You know, none of these of are like... In Texas. Yeah, like who wants to be in who wants to be in Austin, Texas in August when you don't have when central air isn't isn't a like oh yeah uh, isn't isn't a isn't a thing and the humidity and everything else so like yeah the central air I believe plays a giant role in this as well but that's only the pull that only explains why more people live in Phoenix than they used to doesn't explain why everybody leaves leaves Gary I don't. Recall what they used to make in Gary. What was the industry in Gary? Oil? Um, Is it an oil refining town? 
I drive through, I've driven through Gary like I don't know how many times, and I, I have no idea what they used to do there. Um, home of the Jackson family. But anyway, you know, the push factor is definitely the destruction of America's manufacturing base. Uh, if you just think, you know, well, we're just a bunch of consumers, steel it's mill. not very troubling to you. Yeah, steel. Yeah, 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 I knew that. I knew that now that you say it. Um, or I'm recalling that now that you say it. But the um you know if you think that there's like a value to the united states that isn't that can't be measured in dollars and cents that isn't the gdp that isn't the cost of a clock radio this is disastrous and again we talk about a bit of the i'm not going to lean too too heavily on the milton friedman episode and simply referring people there i think that we should cover some of this stuff again Mm -hmm. but i do think that we we covered it very extensively in the milton friedman episode and that people should uh, go listen to that because we explain and talk about that a bit the black middle class suffered pretty heavily because of this um you know it's there's the, the the stereotype of the 50s is that like the entire country was birmingham alabama um, this is just simply not true. Black business ownership had peaked in the United States in the years between the Second World War and the Great Society. So that's about 20 years. Um, every city with any kind of significant black population had a black business district uh, where, you know, the black middle class went to go spend their money. Black home ownership was high that year. Um, I kind of one of my things is that I think that um, the best indicator of how both the best indicator of how your society is doing and the best indicator of and and the best indicator of how your society is doing and the best goal for any society to aspire to for the purpose of social stability or um you know social stability is the cultivation of a broad based middle class in the sense that we use it in america of, you know, which I think is basically we can distill down to being homeowners. Um, I think that home ownership is good because it makes people invested in their society. Um, I think that, you know, it's better than, I think people are still invested in society, but they tend to be invested in it through their retirement account. Um, and, and by which I mean, you know, literally invested. Um, and I think that the home is a much better investment. And I'm, um, I get really like irritated when people think, say that, well, the home, the American dream of home ownership, you know, was, was a mistake and we never should have, that never should have been the goal. And it's like, no, it's actually a great goal for society to have because like if you own a home, that's not some disposable shoddily, um, sh- shoddily put together, um, McMansion or manufactured glorified trailer that, you know, maybe you're going to pass down to your kids or at the very least sell and give the proceeds to your kids. That's a, um, that's an important investment in society that I think has a, has a big value for society and prevents the kinds of, uh, social unrest and social dislocations that result from people not having any kind of investment in society. I think that there is not, I don't, I don't want to get too into the weeds of the specific government policies, but I think that we can note a kind of broad and general trend towards greater concentration of wealth in this country. Um, I, I do not believe that wealth inequality is ever a problem because I don't really care if somebody has a lot more than me, but I do think that wealth concentration is a problem too much too much wealth concentrated into the hands of too few people i believe is a problem for society um and i think that we you know have a, anyway so this is like not not some pinko commie thing <laughs> um the foundation for uh economic education has identified wealth concentration uh as, as you know choking the American economy at the expense of small business. I would say that small business is another good. And if you have a lot of people owning their own businesses, you are probably living in a healthy, transparent, free society because like people don't want to blow stuff up when they own, when they own things and not when they own junk, uh, not when they own, you know, a bunch of Funko pop figures 
and Star Wars uh, crap. But like when people own homes and businesses, they tend to not want to metaphorically or literally light the place on fire. And I think that that is very, very um, important. Um, Also worth noting that integration was another thing that negatively impacted the uh, black business small business ownership you know the like takeaway from this is not that not like well we should still have segregation because black people own businesses it's not a prescriptive uh thing it's just like yeah i mean once um you know under when segregation still existed in the united states black america was kind of this captive audience for black small business for these black business districts you know and once segregation kind of falls apart like well, why do I want to go to the burger stand for black people when I can go to the burger stand for white people that's now for everybody that I've been told my entire life that I can't go to? So that's definitely a play in play here. I mention it only to kind of, you know, be fair and complete. Um, I'm not suggesting that Southern states reintroduce Jim Crow to prop up black business. It's just to kind of say, hey, this is this is also a reason um, why black businesses, black owned small businesses began to evaporate during this time period. The other aspect of this is that it's difficult to kind of quantify the problem. We can only talk around it. Uh, we can only talk around the, the, the impact that the, the loss of the black business district and the erosion of civil society in general has, we can talk around it in statistics like, you know, how many, how many divorces are happening, um, how many people are addicted to, uh, opioids or other drugs. You know, there's a number of, there's a number of ways that we can kind of attempt to quantify this, but there's not any single metric that we can use to say civil society is doing well or civil society is doing poorly. That's so, so when we start talking further, it means that a lot of this stuff can be difficult to, um, to directly tie to whatever the, you know, whatever the policy is. Maybe getting to the point where we start to talk about maybe a establishment of a sort of like welfare state or maybe we should just start talking about the new deal because uh, we can we can go into talking about like certain quantifiable aspects of it but it's not going to really help widen people's lens yeah so i think that like so okay so what uh, the question in the article is what do people do before social welfare um this is interesting because libertarians generally just kind of s- start to like stammer when you ask them this and they mutter something about private charity and like that's definitely true people did rely a lot more on on private charity for meeting the social needs of the less fortunate um, which I think you know has a I believe I do believe that private charity has a number of benefits uh, over the welfare state one of which is that there's I, I believe um, more accountability Um, and, but interestingly, there was like, you know, uh, one thing that I find very interesting is this is a tangent, but I'm going to go down it anyway, is that, uh, during the seventies in the UK in the labor party, um, back when the labor party was still a labor party, it's just kind of a liberal party now, but back when they were still, you know, you like had to be a member of the trade unions to be a voting member of the labor party until I think 1996 or something. Mm. But they one of like the, some of the you know the welfare state is what made them, but they were very um, very much associated with um, other things like tough policing and accountability for people on public assistance. So, and one of the things that happened when um, there were more um, middle class in the in the sense of not being in blue collar jobs. Uh, politicians in the labor party is that the the people who wanted you know like the people who thought legalized drugs and cops being social workers and you know and will just give people benefits without any kind of um, accountability tended to be tended to be the more middle class 
members of the Labour Party's parliamentary group and the and the working class members, people from places like Wigan and um, Leeds and, you know, the industrial centers up north, which were the heartland of the labor voters, they tended to be the ones who, like, you know, thought the cops should be tough and that keeping drugs illegal was a good thing and forcing people to look for work when they were on welfare was, you know, something that should be done. But in any event, I, I you know, I just mentioned this because I think that, that, that that's kind of the you know, the thing, but another, um, accountability is the factor here, but mutual aid, uh, was another thing that we don't, we don't really have anymore. I know people talk about it and like, I know that, you know, my local DSA has a mutual aid group and it's like, it's such a LARP now. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's just, it's, it's gone, it's gone with the wind as they say, but, and the main and the main thing the mutual aid societies did was like life insurance. Um, you would join and you would get you know life insurance. It's kind of like a credit union for life insurance. Uh, these are also known as benefit societies in the UK and Ireland. They're known as friendly societies. Um, in Europe, these date back to the Middle Ages. They're kind of are our, our parallel to guilds in the Middle Ages, um, which were sort of mutual aid societies for uh, people in skilled trades. The, the, in, in America, they were hugely popular with, with black Americans. The, the Free African Society dates back to 1787. If that's not the first, it, it's one of the first mutual aid societies in the United States. Um, and it's a it's strong civil society institution. Why don't doctors do house calls anymore is like a thing people always want to know. Well, one of the reasons why doctors don't do house calls anymore is because mutual aid societies basically were legislated out of existence. So the way that the the house call doctor would work in many cases, though clearly not all, is that, you know, if you were part of the Odd Fellows, which I believe was uh, had a pretty robust mutual aid aspect to it until that was all kind of legislated out of existence. Mm-hmm. You know, or the Grange. The Grange is a really good example. Um, you know, if you were a member, say you're a member of the of the Grange, the way that works is your Grange. They're not called lodges, are they? In the Grange, but anyway, your local, your your Grange local, right? Your Grange local just hires a doctor, and like that's your, you know, that's your health care. You're not getting insurance or you're paying insurance premiums or anything or going to the hospital. There's just the local Grange hired Dr. Smith and you're a member of the Grange. You call up Dr. Smith. He comes over and takes care of you. Your local Grange has just paid his salary for the entire year. So like he just, he's just the doctor for the Grange and he goes around and, you know, does, yeah, it's really cool. It's, 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 it's really cool. Um, Unemployment benefits was another one that they would do. Uh, disability insurance and I think that again like getting back to this accountability thing is like you know you could stay on unemployment theoretically you could stay on mutual aid society unemployment forever and never get cut off but realistically if you were um, just some guy who you know you just some kind of work shy freeloader who doesn't want to go get a new job you're 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 either going to get cut off, or you're going to be subject to enormous social pressure. Yes. Um, to go back to to work because like your neighbors are like, why am I paying my mutual aid society dues so you can you know sit on your butt all day? There were, you know, like there was all kinds of the ancient order of United Workmen, which was a mutual aid society. Their members were not allowed to sell liquor. And if you did, you lost your your life insurance death benefit. I mean, they had all kinds of rules about this kind of thing. But just in general, they had a like, you know, if somebody's gold bricking, they're not just going to be able to do it without any kind of social repercussions. The flip side of that is that if you're receiving these benefits, you're receiving them from your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers and things like that. And so there is an emotional incentive to like, well, I've got to pay all these people back. And the way that I pay these people back is I get back to work and start contributing back to the, you know, the common um, yeah, fund. It's that underlying thread of reciprocity that 
kind of drove these societies as a as a sweet aside because this is a very heavy episode maybe we need to start like a different podcasters guild or something mostly because i wanted Uh, i want the name guild like i want us to be a guild but i think that that would probably be the sweetest thing ever and i've always enjoyed i have a lot of friends who are odd fellows and or in those type of organizations. And I just love the, the community aspect that they bring or, or that I would say it's, it's probably some of that reciprocity. They don't really have like mutual aid anymore, but they do a lot of charity and they do right. a lot of like community fundraising. Like I have a buddy who's an odd fellow, but he also has a charity um, for guys who get injured on motorcycles and, you know, it helps pay, like, their medical bills and stuff like that. It's not like they're not going to buy them a new bike or anything, but it's helping pay their medical bills. And the those guys are just some of the most selfless people. And it is something sad that you don't see this more often. Just- I don't know if I'm allowed to be an odd fellow because Catholics are restricted from joining certain initiatory uh, organizations. And I don't know if I'm... If it- if I'm uh, if it automatically would be denied, excommunicated. Yeah, if it would be denied, it would be denied from the Catholic side, not from the Odd Fellows side. Right, right. No, I know. That's how it works. Yeah, Catholics, like, like you know, I, I'm not, the Catholic Church says I can't become a Freemason, but Freemasons say Catholics are welcome. But um, you know, I, I, I try to follow. I try to follow the rules. I try to do my best. <laughs> so, in 1980, there were 112,000 Americans. Uh, living in housing provided by private, or sorry, that's 1890. There were 112,000 Americans living in housing provided by private charitable organizations. Uh, 73,000 were were living in publicly funded almshouses. I just don't, you know, somebody can correct me if they have the, the statistics, but I just don't believe that there was, you know, another 100,000 people living out on the streets eating garbage. I just don't buy it. And, you know, there's also, as you say, like, there's there's a brotherhood kind of aspect to it. I mean, they had, a lot of them had secret handshakes and stuff like that, which, how cool is that? Yeah. Um, there's other, there, there are other social benefits to private assistance and philanthropy. They tend to be a lot, a lot more uh, leaner in terms of their budgeting and their operations and a lot more innovative and agile in terms of how they respond. Um, it's not a very bureaucratic one sized fits all approach. They tend to look at like the individual in question and, um, do what they can, but they're now, you know, the federal tax code restricts a lot of what they can do and mutual of Omaha used to be a mutual organization, but now it's just, you know, for profit financial institution, even though it kept the name mutual of Omaha. Well, you know, I mean, it has. um, it, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. <laughs> I think another another good thing to put in here, not necessarily that it's in the article or, or any of that, but when you saw these types of organizations take on less and less, I believe at some point the government started taking that. Like now you see the HUD, like the uh, Housing and Urban Urban Development, has kind of taken on some of that. You're seeing more of the publicly funded homes and less of the housing provided by charitable organizations. I think when the when the divide started to happen, the government saw it as a way to, okay, well, well we have to take care of it because nobody else is taking care of it right now. And I... I I'd really be remiss if I didn't say I think that we should go back to guilds and some of these other organiz- mutual organizations, mutual aid organizations, because I think that it it fostered much more than just providing a home or a shelter or a doctor. It provided an opportunity to interact with other people, right? Like that's that's what we're lacking right now is we're lacking the ability to talk with other people and it can only get worse with time and, and distance. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of, kind of, that's, that's it really in a nutshell. (laughs) Um, that's it. We just covered the the entire thing. That's it. We're done. 
so the I mean the decline of family life is another huge uh, way that civil society in America has declined you know there's no real reason to like a lot of these statistics are going to be a few years old but there's but that's because the census comes out every 10 years and um, but there's not um, participate in the census any reason sorry there's not any reason to think that this has declined or turned around but uh, non-college graduates are more than twice as likely to be single parents uh, affluent families are more common than poor ones so those are the two things that you need to know is that this is mostly a crisis that's that's befallen you know the people who used to work in that steel mill in Gary Indiana and not people who are sending their kids to Duke University you know that's I, I think something that needs to be stressed in this Pew research data um, I don't know the year on all of this but um, Americans who have never married reached an all-time high in 2012 uh, that was 25% of all adults over the age of 25. That was 9% in 1960. Uh, men are way less likely to have never been married than women. 24% of never married adults cohabitate with their partner, but like these are not, you know, sorry guys, it's not a value judgment. It's just your, it's just your, your relationship is not uh, as durable as marriage. You know, it is what it is. Uh, black Americans the percentage over 25 who had never been married was 36%. So again, we see that this is, is disproportionately impacting uh, black Americans. The Pew research believes that this trend will continue and people are getting married later in life, but there's not going to be any kind of significant increase in marriage as the population ages. Financial security, number one hurdle to marriage. One third of those polled said they want to get married and the number one reason why they can't is fi is finances um, two-thirds of americans under 40 who are married or in their first marriage as of whenever this poll was taken in you know uh, 2015 i think that was 83 percent in 1960 46 percent of children that's a minority less than half of all children live with two parents in their first marriage that means that, you know, at best kids are living with one, uh, with two parents, but one of them's not theirs. In 1980, that number was 61%. And in 1960, it was 73%. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when like, it was, it was not, it was not the norm that, you know, a kid's parents were divorced. Um, it's much more the norm now and the uneducated and the, um, non-affluent are the ones who are significantly being uh, impacted by this centralization of the economy, the financialization of the economy, the deindustrialization of the economy. You know, that's, that's the thing. I mean, again, like the Milton Friedman episode goes into this extensively, so please go listen to it. But a lot, it was much easier to get a job with a high school education uh, that, you know, came with a defined benefit pension and healthcare and wages that could support a family and that's just not the case anymore so it's difficult to blame any specific factor but that's that's definitely going on there the the welfare state evidence suggests that this is a driver of the decline of the nuclear family um, the black family has been massively impacted by this in 1965 25 percent of all black children were born out of wedlock that sure sounds like a lot um, but in 19, in 2016, that number had blown up all the way to 70%. And in some urban areas, it was as high as 80%. So that means there are cities in this country where four out of five kids are being, uh, raised by single parents. Um, and we have a, you know, this is not some like, oh, Sam's being a Catholic fuddy duddy about this. It's like, no, we have like significant mountains of evidence to suggest that, outcomes for children are much better when there are two parents in the home. Um, in the 1940s, it was 5% of black children that were born out of, out of wedlock, which was pretty much the same as, as white children. Um, the Hispanic out of wedlock birth rate in 2016 was 52%. And for whites, it was 30%. And this, um, you know, we have to talk about this in 
the context of Johnson's Great Society, which is a massive expansion of the welfare state beginning in 1965. There's a report from the Mises Institute that we linked to on the article um, about why this is. The basic, the gist of the argument is that welfare disincentivizes marriage. Uh, if you think that marriage is some awful, evil, patriarchal institution that oppresses women, then you think that's great. If you look at the data and see that um, the outcomes that it has on children and indeed the happiness of society in general, then, you know, marriage and families are in fact good things. And I believe that they are not because of some superstitious Roman popery, but because I can look at statistics and see that this is the case. So we now have a whole host of um, assistance programs. They tend to target single motherhood and thus uh, incentivize it. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, people are going out and getting pregnant because they know that the welfare state will take care of them. What I'm suggesting is that people used to face stigmas for being in single single parent households that they do not face and that now come with incentives and that it's an entirely unconscious process. Um, I just want to run down a few statistics about uh, fatherless homes in the United States, which are, as we've established increasingly the norm. Um, 63% of youth suicides are in fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless youth are from fatherless homes. That's 32 times the national average. Uh, 85% of all children with behavior issues come from a fatherless home. 80% of rapists with established anger issues come from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 70% of those in state-operated institutions, i.e. prisons and mental asylums and things like that, come from fatherless homes. 85% of all juveniles in prison come from single-parent households. 90% of adolescent repeat arson offenders come from fatherless homes. And, you know, if none of this moves you, Fatherless children are about twice as likely to be victims of, of, of abuse and neglect. So I think that there is a significant mount, like there's a big heaping mountain of evidence that single parent households have bad incomes and uh, bad outcomes. And I don't think that, that there's like anything ne- I don't think it's necessary. Um, nor do I think that there's any benefit to, you know, beating up on single, on single parent households. I just think that this is the society in which we live and where things have gone. Um, but I do think that it's clear that these are bad outcomes for children and that they are, and, and, and that they are bad outcomes for society in general. I mean, basically what this means is that like, you know, well, anyway, um, <laughs> No, because I realized I was about to do. I, I walked back because I realized I was about to commit a uh, commit a, uh, a logical fallacy, so I decided not to do it. But I, the, the 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 summary here, the wrap up, is that like single parent households are really bad for kids. It doesn't matter, you know. You don't have to be a religious person or a social conservative to think this. You only need to be able to look at sociological data. And, and the thing, too, is, like, if this stuff was all, you know, 57%, 54%, you'd kind of go, eh, whatever. It's, you know, it's all about equal. But it's, like, 90% of homeless youths, 90%, 85% of children with behavior issues. Yeah. 90% of repeat arson offenders. Like, that's the one that stands out the most to me because it's, like, if you're a repeat, if you're, like, an a adolescent repeat arson offender... You have some really serious issues yeah. that probably come from the twice as likely to be a victim of an abuse or neglect statistic. And I don't think that like there, that, that it's, that there's a tenable argument to be made that like, well, if we just beefed up the welfare state, this would all kind of disappear. Like we have an article on the war on poverty. We have an article on the great society, the war on poverty and the great society effectively flushed, 20 moon landings down the toilet it's done absolutely nothing this is like the war on poverty and the tsa are my two (laughs) things that i bang on about or like this does absolutely nothing it's not like it even not like it helps a little bit even 
does absolutely nothing. And we have tons of evidence that it does absolutely nothing to improve the situation that it's designed to improve. So why do we keep doing it? It's this stupid kabuki where we're not ever allowed to like walk back any any government programs. Once they're opened up, that's it. They're there for good. Well, it's when you have established leaders in that organization that you're paying a ton of money to who don't want to find another job, and then you get into the cloak and dagger, or whatever, whatever takes place behind the scenes in big government. And I mean, yeah, and their unions are really powerful, and you know, there's all kinds of reasons for it. But um, it's astonishing to me that people don't kind of just go kick back and go, maybe we should do something different. And by something different, I don't mean just do it more. <laughs> you know, like that's that's the like. Well, we should we should you know just kind of do what we're doing, but turn it up to eleven. It's like no, the thing that we're doing doesn't work. The thing that we're doing is not repairing the breach and the breach is the decline of civil society and there's no um you know i don't think that it's all big businesses fault though i think they play a role i don't think that it's all big government's fault though i do think that they both of those play a um significant role in what we're talking about um but the i think the thing that i want to leave people with on this is the kind of, you know, self reinforcing quality that, that this destruction of civil society has, because when civil society disappears, the needs that it filled, whether those are tangible needs, like, you know, a roof over your head or a doctor to come take care of you when you're sick or intangible needs like companionship, socializing, civic involvement, all of which I think are good things. I think that a lot of the best things in, 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 you know, for society are, are the intangibles. And, and when those things go away, they get replaced with something else. And the only institutions in the 21st century that are capable, that are big enough to fill that void are the government and wall street, you know, and I don't have a lot of love for either of those institutions. And I don't think that they're capable, willing, or equipped to deal with the, the problems that we're talking about. Smaller communities in particular have to increasingly rely upon, you know, I mean, everyone knows, or everyone listening to this, I think, would know that, you know, there's kind of like, there are, there are towns in America where the only store you can go to is Walmart yeah. because all the small businesses have been chased out of town, um, both by government policy and by Walmart. Um, I don't want to, you know, specifically be beat up on Walmart because I think it's kind of tired and simplistic, but like, yeah, you know, like there's towns where it's, it's all, where, where, where are you going to go shop? Walmart. That's it. Where's the jobs in town? Walmart, Motel 6, and a gas station. And that's it. Mm-hmm. So, it becomes difficult, especially for smaller communities to kind of do anything about this. Um, it's harder to resist the, 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 the disempowerment of those communities and the growth of big business and big government in their lives. And I think that it's, for me, it's almost like axiomatic that big government and big business are bad. <laughs> but, um, I think that there's also, you know, significant evidence to suggest that big business and big government are bad in that. And as much as they, you know, not from some like mystical point of view of like, I have this belief for no reason, but that we have a a lot of evidence that when you, the, the greater involvement, the government and big business have in your community, the the worse the outcomes are. And that is where I'm going to leave it. I think that that was good. I did we touched on a lot of things that happened in this article. The thing that I think I will leave the listeners with is get outside of your house, walk down the street, wave to your neighbors, go to a town hall meeting, go to a PTA meeting, join a club, join a group or a guild, and learn to reconnect 
with your civil society, your local society. Because once we start to to take part in this globalization phenomenon that sweeps across America, eventually we're just going to get caught up in it and we're not even going to know who our neighbor is down the street. And we're going to know people in all these other countries and we'll want to help them and not help ourselves. So, you know, just get out and participate, do something. But while you're doing something, make sure you go to ammo.com forward slash podcast so that you can get $20 off of a $200 purchase. But for Sam and I, we will see you next time on the resistance library. Thank you all for tuning in to the resistance library brought to you by ammo.com. At this time, we would like to encourage you to go to your podcast listening platform of choice and leave a rating, a comment, tell us what you liked, tell us what you didn't, so that we can make the perfect show for you every week. And we will see you next time on the Resistance Library.